So good morning. Uh, it's it's great to be here. Uh, I uh, uh, so I, I come from the patient perspective, and so I want to share you a little bit about how patients can uh, actively engage uh, with payers, with stakeholders, with regulators uh, to try to define value and helpfully uh, influence the value proposition so that the right therapies reach the right, reach the right patients uh, at the right time. Uh, by way of disclosures, probably a couple things of note. Uh, I do serve on the governing board of ICER. I was invited to join them a couple years ago, I guess about a year ago, a year and a half ago, uh, as a patient. Uh, and I also do some uh, work with a number of the gene therapy companies, including Spark and Pfizer on their data safety boards, and uh, helping Biomarin and Unicure develop their uh, outcomes programs. So this is my life when I was born in 1960. Hemophilia was a disease where the life expectancy was somewhere in the 20s, uh, early 30s. Uh, so today, I'm 58 years old. So obviously, I've beat those odds, and science has advanced enormously. Uh, hemophilia is a bleeding disorder where your blood is lacking uh, an essential protein that allows the blood to clot normally. Uh, typically, the worst manifestations are internal bleeding into the joints. It leads to crippling arthropathy. Uh, I had my 13th orthopedic surgery just two months ago, uh, which really allows me to, uh, to stand here uh, and talk with you today. So long periods of isolation in childhood. And although we've made great progress uh, in the developed world, uh, this still is the picture of what's happening in the rest of the world. And I would hope as we think about gene therapy, we don't forget that uh, there's a huge population out there uh, that may not yet benefit, and we need to find ways uh, uh, and have the same pricing and value discussions and how we bring those uh, to the rest of the world. So uh, this is simply uh, the progress, and we are on the cusp. Uh, there are about nine companies uh, that I know of uh, are in active gene therapy trials in one form or another using uh, one vector or a different one, and uh, it is, uh, seems tantalizingly close for us. There's a lot of knowns, there's a lot of unknowns, there's things that we still don't know, uh, but uh, it comes to us, uh, unlike Lexterna, it comes to the population where an existing therapy actually exists. And that does change the discussion, it changes the paradigm, the conversation that we're gonna have between clinicians and patients, the conversation that we're gonna have with payers, uh, and the way uh, 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 regulators are gonna think about the risk that's acceptable uh, for patients to accept when there is an alternative, uh, albeit imperfect. So the perspective uh, of how we begin to think about value really matters. Uh, I could be the man standing on the island uh, looking to be saved. Uh, I be, could be the man uh, cast at sea in the boat uh, looking for land. And, but whatever perspective you have, it is important to recognize that the patient perspective is unique, and it probably is different than the way many of you have thought about it. So this actually is a quote from the FDA. It was a quote that they used at the launch of the Patient-Focused Drug Development Initiative, um, I guess now five or six years ago, and I think it's sort of been the hallmark of what the FDA has been trying to do to enhance the patient voice within the regulatory program. So as I think about the value proposition or what value in healthcare is, uh, I, I like the work of Mike Porter, a Harvard economist. He's been thinking about this for quite a while, published widely, and his, uh, uh, his work sort of goes back to, to 2010. Typically, the kind of thing that is tracked in clinical trials, that is tracked in the clinical setting, are those things that can be counted, the hard numbers that, uh, that really are easy to quantify. But what really matters, and what matters to me as a patient, uh, are things that allow me to function in life, uh, the quality of life, something that would allow me to go to school, to get an education I would like, to get a job, to support a family, and to participate in life. Those are not the things that we measure. And so we may be treating an arbitrary number that really is not a solution. And that becomes particularly important when a, when a drug already exists in a therapy, is what's being left on the table, what's not being considered in the value proposition. So what we wanted to do, uh, and I was one of the three core investigators that worked on this, is at, in a pre-competitive space, because there is no hemophilia gene therapy on the market now, could we bring together all of the relevant stakeholders to define how would we measure therapies uh, or success for gene therapy relative to the standard of care? We know there's something different about being cured. Uh, I, I expect it to be transformative. 
uh, when I have that opportunity. But certainly uh, it would eliminate uh, a lot of the daily risks of bleeding that I have to go on. So could we develop a core outcome set of measures? And there's a methodology to do this. It's not unique to, to our thinking. But could we develop a core set of measures that would allow us to differentiate and distinguish a curative technology from the standard of care? So we convened about 75 individuals. Uh, it included the six largest payers in the US. I, I think the top six largest. And, uh, the, uh, we had uh, all seven of the companies at the time that were in the hemophilia gene therapy space. Uh, all of our federal partners, including the FDA, the EMA, um, uh, the, the Canadian Health Authorities, Cadeth, NICE, ICER, patient organizations, a robust group of all of the stakeholders, and we went through uh, a, a Delphi process as well as in-person meetings, uh, literature reviews, uh, sort of the typical process to try to define a process. And the general premise is that if every company uses a different standard to major outcomes, we're going to end up with variable results and inconsistency. It's not only going to serve payers, it's, it's not only not going to serve payers uh, because they're not going to be able to compare and figure out the relative value of one drug versus another. We're not going to have the information to actually serve me as a patient. I'm not going to be able to make a decision whether I want gene therapy A or gene therapy B, or whether gene therapy compared to standard of care is the right thing for me. So could we find a way to select the right elements for clinical trials that would actually span the entire continuum of the drug development process? I think uh, historically it has been a binary process that you think about market authorization and, and then you think about market access. And in this scenario, we really think it should expand even further, that if we could develop a set of outcomes that could be collected consistently, that would serve the purposes for market authorization, that would serve purposes for evaluation and the value proposition for market access, and then would serve the purpose for me as a patient when I'm making that shared decision with my clinician, is it right for me, uh, we would advance the field and hopefully we would reach the, uh, the decisions uh, with a common understanding of what mattered uh, to each of us. So the historical metric with hemophilia has been the annual bleed rate. Uh, that's the number of times that I actually have a bleeding episode uh, during the course of the year. Modern therapies have actually lowered that, but uh, it's, uh, it's a subjective number. It's something that I self-report. I may recognize a bleed, I may not. It may be internal. It may still be manifesting in joint damage, but it's not limiting my life. And, uh, and in fact, uh, it often uh, the current therapies don't achieve zero, and we know that every single bleed into a joint, when blood pools, it starts that uh, joint deterioration and damage. And so the historical metric, sort of the legacy metric that we've used, probably isn't the right thing when we're talking about a curative technology, is uh, we're not going to be able to measure it. But one of our challenges as we started talking about advanced therapies is there is a general assumption that life is pretty good with hemophilia. And certainly compared to the 20 years old that I was supposed to reach and, and now approaching 60, it is remarkable, but uh, as I've explained along the way, I've had significant challenges in terms of orthopedic problems uh, and, uh, and all of the pain and limitations that come with it. So as patients and clinicians, we first started that um, maybe we could align, and oh, I'm sorry, maybe we could align, in fact, agree on what we thought the right outcome should be. Mm -hmm. So we took the leading patient organizations, a group of leading clinicians, and we actually uh, uh, thought we should publish a paper to try to influence the primary endpoints that are used in the clinical trials. And the legacy outcome of annual bleeding rate, uh, we don't believe has the capacity or the sensitivity to, to give us that right answer to define uh, value and to fully define what is efficacious, but that we need to look something beyond that and actually look at are we normalizing the level of clotting factor that is circulating in my blood? And perhaps that's a better uh, jumping off point to begin to measure it. And in fact, the reason that uh, we're so fixated on, on factor activity level is the therapy that I use, the IVs that I would do every other day, um, are de were de that whole concept was designed back in 1962. That was based really on limitations of technology at the time, and we treated to a 1% of normal level. So that moved somebody with severe hemophilia like myself to a moderately severe state. So I might not be risk of, uh, at risk of spontaneous bleeding, but I'm still at risk of chronic arthropathy uh, and other joint damages and have to make decisions of every aspect of my life about what I'm going to do. Recent research has indicated that uh, I'm really not even, sorry, this is very sensitive, um, I'm really not free of 
joint bleeding until I reach at least 15%. Uh, normal is somewhere north of 40%. So as we start thinking about comparing and cost offsets, we have to remember that the cost comparison that we're making may already be based on a suboptimal therapy, and it's not a straight dollar for dollar transition. So we need to find a way to bring some color and add information to that. So the core outcome set uh, really needs to expand beyond those two core clinical metrics to really help us understand what else is going on. The FDA, as part of their patient-focused drug development initiative, uh, launched what's called the, uh, uh, the Voice of the Patient series. Uh, we applied and we were fortunate to be one of the 24 original uh, disease groups that included all the bleeding disorders, including von Willebrand disease and the rare factor deficiencies, to see if we could uh, come up with and identify what are the outcomes that matter to us as patients. And so this is the summary, and, and I really quite like the concluding paragraph of the FDA report. Uh, we've done a lot, as I've already demonstrated. Clearly things have advanced, but there are still wide areas uh, that need to be addressed um, in terms of the economic, social, and educational barriers that remain. I have to pick my career very carefully. I had to pick, I mean, I, I wanted to be a lawyer, uh, but, uh, but I couldn't do some things. I wanted to go into the foreign service. If I pick, wanted to pick a, a job that uh, required me to be on my feet and be manual, you know, those were not career opportunities that were available at the time. Uh, and, uh, and everything from the types of vacations, that where you live, whether you near, live near a treatment center, family life, all of those things are impacted in every decision that you make every day. Am I going to go to the gym? When's the last time that I did my infusion? Can I play sports or participate? So those are the kinds of things that were talked about. Number one on the list was pain. Two-thirds of the individuals live with chronic pain or under pain management. Uh, and the second most important one on that list was anxiety. And I think we all know about the challenges with the opioid use in the country and the mental health uh, challenges that are going on. I think we just saw in the paper last week that the U.S. population is one of the most stressed in the world. Um, and so manage the, uh, uh, the, the impact of living with hemophilia on top of that. So can we find ways to actually measure those and have them included in the value proposition? And could gene therapy address aspects of our lives that standard of care is not? Um, it's something novel, it's something uh, perhaps different than the way, um, and this is not typically modeled in the kind of quality analysis that we talk about. Uh, so ICER uh, actually just reviewed a hemophilia drug. So they reviewed another drug, uh, a, a novel mimetic, that uh, was originally brought to market to treat those that have inhibitory antibodies uh, to the standard of care. Uh, the cost can run in the millions uh, for these patients, uh, and they're in the hospital 30 plus times a year, uh, bleeding at least uh, once a week. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this drug has actually gone on to have an expanded indication for the general patient uh, population. Um, it, it, it's financially toxic. The drug bills, I think as you've already heard, um, are a half million up for somebody with severe hemophilia, sort of an average adult male weight. Uh, and plus all of the other complications and knowing that year in and year out I have to come up with a $12,000 copay uh, in January to be able to access uh, my drugs. Uh, so changing that paradigm would certainly be important uh, and the pricing does become important but ICER too, like the FDA, has acknowledged that there are other contextual factors. If you went and read this report it would be many of the same things that you actually read on the list. But if you go into the modeling and you go into the quality calculations uh, of, uh, of what's happening, the kinds of things that I'm talking about in terms of patient impact are typically not included in those. Uh, and it's not just because they can't be. Uh, often it's because that data was not collected, it wasn't planned, it wasn't put into the clinical trial development program, it wasn't reported, it's not in the pivotal publications, and therefore at the point that a pricing decision is being made, that a value decision is being made, we don't have the information on the outcomes the most relevant to patients. So through this core heme process, we thought, can we change that paradigm and convince payers that um, if we can identify that data that includes the typical metrics as well as those that are important to patients, and we get companies, the life sciences companies, that are developing those technologies to include them in their studies, then uh, maybe we'll be better off in the end. And so I, uh, you know, this whole notion of evidence generation, evidence collection, it clearly has to be robust. But real-world information may well be different than clinical trial information, but we ought to do our best to collect the real-world experience of living with the disease during the clinical trial period. 
As individuals, and some of you may well live with chronic disease, uh, you spend less than 1% of your time in the clinic or the hospital setting. It's the other 99% of your life that make you who you are, and it's that whole of life experience that we would like to find a way to try to capture. So through our research process, and there's gonna be a poster on this tomorrow afternoon, I'll be there if you wanna learn sort of the whole process that we went through. We have a couple published articles now. We developed a core set of outcomes, and typically a core set of outcomes is really only six to eight elements. Uh, and I, I sort of break them down in two. So the two legacy clinical outcomes that I talked about made this list, frequency of bleeds and the factor activity level, although I have a preference for factor activity level, I certainly want to know that it's stopping bleeding, so efficacy uh, and a bleeding metric is important. The two patient-centric outcomes, uh, chronic pain and mental health status, that transformative impact of being cured of disease, not having the worry, the fear, the life opportunities that open up, can we measure that? And then two that really, I think, directly relate to payers, the duration of expression that we heard Michael talk about earlier, how long is it going to last? Fortunately, we have some pretty good data, um, you know, heading out uh, five to ten years. So we think we're going to meet that threshold. And then the utilization of healthcare costs. Again, we have a cost offset, but it may not be sufficient to achieve uh, the advanced standard of care. The other elements, adverse events, I mean, certainly all of those things should be collected as a part of a core event, mortality, mm -hmm. and both short and long term. Um, uh, and then there's some other things that didn't quite make our 80% threshold for agreement across all of the stakeholders, but that were recognized important and had over half, uh, and so we encourage those as secondary uh, endpoints. So I guess I'll close sort of with my key takeaways that I do think that as you're thinking about defining the value proposition, early and active engagement of patients, very much in that translational phase, even as you're thinking about coming to clinic the first time, understanding what are the outcomes that matter to patients, what, how is it, what a patient would define success, and developing your clinical programs to incorporate those. If you have active and rigorous engagement, uh, then I think it will serve us all well, not only at the point that you're getting your ticket from the FDA or the EMA or a regulatory body, or you're getting somebody to pay for it um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the insurer world, but also uh, patients will be a lot happier, a lot more confident in making the decisions to take what are still novel and potentially high-risk therapies. So think about patients not just as subjects of research studies, but think about patients as active partners in the process. Thank you.